Well, hello, hello. Okay. <laughs> Going to continue going through another module this week. This time we're going to talk about the lab. Digital forensics labs have a variety of rules and regulations to them. <clears throat> you can't just designate a room to be the lab and you're done. The American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors is a nonprofit uh, that provides guidelines and standards for forensic labs. That way you don't have to build it completely out of the blue. You have rules to help you build a proper lab that again will, uh, will fly in court. You can use the ISO IEC 17025-2017. It is a uh, general requirements for the competence of testing and calibrating labs. The Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence is a federal, state, and local law enforcement group who don't have commercial interests. There are private sector labs, like the ones that I was talking about last week who have every connection and cable known to man. They make profit through client consultation, internal fraud, or fraud suffered by customers. Banks and credit card companies have their own internal practitioners. All major accounting firms have labs uh, to support their investigations that are required by are requested by clients. They fall under e-discovery, detection of electronic data for the purposes of litigation. A plaintiff is the party making the claim against another party and initiates the lawsuit can request an electronically stored information such as email, Word documents, spreadsheets, databases, and more. Under Sarbanes-Oxley, publicly traded companies must maintain all electronic information for a specific period of time. Retention times for documents is dependent on the type of document in the industry. Any US company with European ties has to adhere to GDPR. Sometimes the Security and Exchange Commission will issue a 10 day notice to a publicly traded company to produce documents pertaining to any investigation. E-discovery generally requires the expertise of forensic investigators, IT staff, and corporate lawyers. Forensic and IT locate evidence and ensure it is acquired properly. The lawyers will determine the value of the data that's extracted. So it's not on you, the investigator, to determine what is pertinent to the case and what isn't. You are objectively gathering information and objectively presenting it to the court. Leave it up to the lawyers to determine uh, the value and what, what they're gonna bring. In the lab, you have evidence acquisition extracting evidence from storage devices to create those read-only image files. The staff should be able to use a variety of imaging software, password cracking tools, and decrypting drive tools. 
anything email should be parsed to make it easier for the attorneys involved to go through. You should have really good inventory. If an investigation involves thousands of storage media with varying sources, you must have already in place proper management and control of storage. Because all this has to get documented and presented. There's also information management systems. These can be critical to ensure cases are managed appropriately and prioritized, providing a comprehensive reporting system so case metrics can be reported to help senior management justify those costs. And web hosting. Web hosting can provide a safe and effective way to display evidence to plaintiff and defense counsels. Now this little picture is just a little picture. Don't treat it as gospel. We have a small little layout of two different types of computers. Your standard workstation who probably runs Windows or Linux or both. A Mac for all things Mac. A workbench area that's cleared and uh, equipment and evidence lockers. Your workstations handle the acquiring of those image files. These computers should be protected with MFA. These computers should be powerful. You want them to increase the examiner's productivity and also not choke when using a lot of tools. Your workbench is your typical computer repair workbench. You, know, you have things like rubber mats so that no static electricity will interfere with the subject uh, the suspect's device. It should be ample enough to be able to dismantle any computers and have plenty of lighting to safely work and photograph everything. You could also have a specific area for mobile devices to dismantle them and perform any soldering as necessary. And speaking of, here are some things that could be useful for a mobile forensics area. This is a, uh, a guideline for a field kit storage unit. This kit is useful to execute warrants and perform on-site collections as part of the crime scene investigators. The hardware and the software required will of course differ from the lab tools and it'll also differ depending on what you're doing. So if you're working for an internal company who has a standardized workstation, you're gonna have different hardware and software because you know what's there, you know the infrastructure. If we're talking a private lab, yeah, your field kit's gonna be pretty big because you don't always know what you're gonna walk into. Let's look at the picture here. Um, th these suckers are all cloning devices. 
every lab should have a forensic disk duplicator. These all prevent a, uh, a system from writing to the, to the source drive. So they all have various types of connections. Like this one over here has nothing but firewires. This one has an old IDE. Uh, some of them will have SATA, but they all do the same job of allowing you to clone a drive or make an image of a drive without uh, allowing any write actions to happen. You should have a toolkit that has all the different types of connections and things that you'll need in order to remove whatever you walk into. You should have plenty of evidence bags. They prevent any tampering of the device and also keep track of who had access to this disk or whatever is in here when, which again is all critical information for a court. Along with these things, having things like a Faraday room or a Faraday box to prevent a mobile device from talking to the outside network is good because that's how things like cell phones and, and other devices like that get, get altered. Um, that if Faraday boxes or rooms do pose a little problem because when a, a device, a cell phone, let's say, is in one <clears throat> and it realizes it can't reach out to a, to a tower, they tend to use more power to increase their signal to try to get um, to try to get to a tower. So you start racing against the clock when you connect a mobile device, uh, when you put a mobile device in a Faraday box or room. An evidence locker should have should be either a tamper resistant room or a tamper resistant uh, a cabinet to store all the evidence for the cases that you're working on. And yes, Joe, so you could get a set like this on Amazon or build it yourself. a couple more examples of, of more things that you need to watch out for in your lab. Besides having tools like autopsy, um, there's so many, FTK, NCASE, Mac Marshall, Blacklight, uh, having virtual machine software to test any code, password cracking software in order to bypass encryption on user accounts, things to look out for. Uh, for example, in pictures is the metadata that contains date and time when the photo was taken. The make and model of the camera and any and things like embedded thumbnails. Uh, sometimes you even have the, the geographic location. Most forensic tools get eff efficiently find and display photo images in separate categories. More photos can be found by carving pictures embedded in other files or reconstructing them through fragments. If a fragment is overwritten, then reconstruction is virtually impossible. Yes, Excel files have quite the amount of info.
Um, <clears throat> other miscellaneous, but not miscellaneous, that still are part of the lab. Energy requirements. With all the work required, like imaging, password cracking, processing, um, the room where the forensics lab will be should be upgraded by an electrician. It should have an un uninterruptible power supply should power be lost. Because we're talking a lot of electrical equipment to have the proper fire extinguishers inside and outside of the lab. Uh, along with other safety measures like anti-glare screens, adjustable keyboards, that kind of stuff. A fully functional a computer crime lab is expensive. The setup and maintenance costs alone are high. And outside of staff salary, you still have to buy software licenses. You have to continue to educate your staff, uh, continue to upgrade materials and equipment. You also have to buy a lot of harvest drives. And as you guys are aware, hard drives are not cheap right now. So you can imagine the budgets of uh, forensic labs is really up for their drives. Lab access should be restricted. Ideally, only those who handle evidence and run the lab should have access to it. I have a mentor who works at JPL, who is part of the forensics team. And his boss and everybody else left and right or up and down does not have access to the forensics room. It is just him and the other investigators, nobody else. Even the custodians don't have a master key to that room. And that's built on purpose because you don't want anybody who isn't authorized to be in that room having that close access to evidence. So you restrict who comes in, uh, you review the, the uh, lab data and evidence in a strict manner, because everything you do with evidence will be scrutinized in a courtroom. That room should not have any other way for physical entry. For example, no windows, no false ceilings and such. And everybody who walks in should be, uh, should be signed in, should be accounted for. Nobody just get, nobody waltzes in to a forensics lab. Now, some stuff that you'll see as forensic examiners, uh, just to cover a few examples, but as forensic examiner, you should be well-versed in Linux with tools like DD, DC, 3DB, GREP, just to name a few. It is very important that you are well-versed and know how to use the Linux terminal. Using tools like the one I listed uh, earlier can help digging into suspect systems to get information such as banking credit cards. 
For example, there's a distinctive group of banking credit cards that are issued through banks or issued directly to the customer without a secondary bank. Capital One is an example of its own category. It is a bank that issues its own credit cards. When searching for credit card numbers on a computer, it is helpful to know the numbering system or the major, the major industry identifier and how that works. So major industry identifier, if it starts with the three, we see the type of category it is and who issues that type of card. The issuer identification number refers to the first six digits on a credit card. So if you're searching for evidence and you find a 34 or 37 range, then you know it's an American Express was used. If it starts with four, it's a visa. These are things that the, uh, the financial folks, uh, the financial investigators look for. When it comes to checks, American Bankers Association numbers are found on checks and indicate how the financial instrument, the check, is to be routed through the banking system. The first two digits correspond to a Federal Reserve Bank. An investigator can quickly ascertain the exact branch and the bank for a check by uh, an online tool that I linked in the lecture notes for you. Uh, the one, if you are looking at your stuff like I did when I first found it, it it's a pretty cool thing, though. No? Start looking at your checks, start looking at your cards and go, oh, okay, that's what those numbers mean. These are things that forensic investigators in the finance world are looking for. When they're trying to track where did a check go and they're looking at computers, they're looking for this information. And again, this is, this is just a small sample of a realm of forensic investigators. But just to show you that not only do you have to have knowledge of digital forensics in general, which is what this class is all about, when you pick what, what field you want to do that in, you'll have to grab on that information as well. So just because you're a master of, say, autopsy, doesn't mean you just automatically can walk into any field and do forensic investigation for them. You'll have to learn about that field, too. Shifting gears just a bit, but still in the finance realm. There are skimmers. Electronic devices used to capture data from magnetic strips on a debit card, or pre, uh, debit, credit, or prepaid. They're used by identity thieves worldwide. Uh, these are generally battery rated operated and purchased online. Uh, there are things like the parasite skimmer used on point of sale systems. They could compromise the terminal or be a phony terminal, capturing the data, but not functioning as a payment system. They could use Bluetooth to remotely transfer the data. They generally have fake paper thin keypads that sit under the legitimate keypad in order to capture the pins. 
There's also ATM who uses a false front with a tiny cap, uh, tiny camera to capture the pin. Interestingly, interestingly enough, these devices can be quite complex and contain encrypted or even password protected data to prevent other thieves from using the captured data. You'll see quite often the FBI and Secret Service involved in these types of investigations in the US. Uh, lastly, we have steganography, the process of concealing data like files or messages within another file. These concealed data could be stored in plain text or it could also be encrypted. While it generally is problematic to find that type of hidden data, usually the only way to know that this is happening is by uh, realizing that a file is larger than it should. There are steg analysis tools like steg detect, steg spy, steg watch that can be used also to detect uh, steganography occurring. Extracting concealed data can be challenging since you generally need the application used to put the information there in the first place in order to get it out. Not to say it isn't impossible, not to say that it is out of your reach. Any questions? Now, last week, I gave you the heads up to download the lab files ahead of time, these, because this week you'll begin to use them. So um, you should have at least 60 gigs, but like I said, 500 would be perfect. That way you have all your, uh, all the, the case files, all of these and their zips already in one place. Give it plenty of core and plenty of RAM to get through them. There are a bunch of uh, quizzes. Don't fret over them, don't rush through them. They are related to the case files in here, in the labs.zip file. So hopefully last week or throughout the last week, you downloaded the, uh, the labs.zip file. Now you can extract it and one at a time, get them into, uh, into autopsy to do the various labs. If you run out of time or you run out of attempts, just let me know. I'll reset it. It's not so much about, oh, you, uh, you had three shots and you missed them all and, and you're stuck with that forever. Just ask, I'll reset it. Th this is all about learning by doing, playing with the tool and uh, doing your best. And if you just so happen to run out of attempts, just just say it's not it's not the worst thing in the world. I see a question. I am still confused on how to download the files to GCP instance. Uh, you know what? I think 
Someone else had that question? I'll uh, jump into Google Cloud now. We need an instant and we'll call it Windows test, but they don't want space, so we'll do that. And switch to a Windows server. I want, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna pick Windows Data Center with desktop experience, not core. And I don't necessarily need 100 gigs, but I'm just going to do that for kicks and giggles. I don't need HTTP or HTTPS access. I don't need anything else. So go ahead and create. Well, it does that. I need to get my RDP client. Because you know it's a Windows VM and it always takes forever to be ready. No, I said uh, make a drive, make the storage of five hundred, so you have plenty of room. Get my Windows password here. I'm going to copy this. Actually, in my download, I'm going to open the RDP file with Adam. Oh, my username is there. Uh, can I use the quizzes from module three for autopsy reference if needed? Absolutely. That should work. So now that I edited my RDP file, oh, I know, I know what I did different. This project that I have has different firewall rules. Let's see which one I need to enable so that I can get RDP. Oh, this is called RDP. Okay. You go back here. I have different projects for different things. So I want the network tags, RDP. No, not RIP. Okay, that'll work. As soon as it takes effect, of course. Eileen, did you give it? Um, more CPU and memory? Or did you just give it storage? Okay, that should allow me to connect. Ah, hey, you didn't save the password. Weirdo. Oh, well, good thing I saved it in this file.
You? Yeah, continue. Hooray. Okay. No, I don't need it to be discoverable. In fact, I'm going to get rid of this thing in a bit. Well, because we're on Windows Server, usually Internet Explorer has a good yet annoying uh, setting, the enhanced security configuration. So usually on Windows servers, you gotta go from the server manager into local server, uh, find the IE enhanced configuration and turn that sucker off. There it is, now it's off. I open up the Internet Explorer and it says not enabled. This will now allow me to go, for example, to my site, to the DF page pages and download the file. And this way, I'm downloading them, uh, not onto my local system. I'm doing it just uh, from Google's own backbone. Do I have to disable the firewalls and VPN services as well? Uh, no, you just saw the only thing I did was I made a Windows server. Uh, by default in your projects, uh, RDP is accessible. This project that I'm doing this demo on doesn't have it enabled, so I had to add the uh, the network tag. But that that was more on my end than yours. So you would make a Windows Server RDP into it, disable the internet, um, the IE thingy, the the enhanced security, and then. You could download anything you want through IE or get like Firefox and go from there. Yes, Austin, as long as you add, you follow the previous instructions to set up a VM, add more RAM, add more storage, add more CPU power, you'll be able to process files much faster. And because these are all VMs in the cloud, I would encourage you when you are going to process a file to beef up the VM. So uh, if I install autopsy and I'm gonna process the first lab, I would increase the CPU and RAM so that it doesn't choke. It doesn't take forever in a day. And then when it's done processing, then I can, I can bring down the CPU and RAM because now I'm just looking through everything that was processed. I mean, uh, minimal should be a four core. 16 gig. And that's what you do. 
to get um, to get the process going. Uh, really, that's the only one because we're only using Compute Engine when you don't need the VM, turn it off. So let's say you work on, on this lab uh, for an hour or so, and then you're gonna go do grocery shopping or you're gonna do whatever, uh, you're gonna go handle life. You're not gonna come back to this uh, instance for a while, just turn it off. If you are processing a bunch of uh, files, maybe it would be a good idea to let it run while you go do something else and then come back when it's done. Especially for the larger cases. Uh, uh, on the larger cases, it's gonna take a while to process. I wouldn't necessarily be worried about that. You can make, you can edit these. I mean, it's a virtual machine. It just happens to be in the cloud. You can edit it just like you would a local. So yes, you, Aileen, you should be able to, you are able to make edits to it after you make it. Just like any virtual machine, you will need to turn it off first before you make things like CPU and RAM and storage uh, changes. The only difference here is we're using Google's machines and Google's internet rather than your local machine <clears throat> and local internet. Which is a good thing. Because if your local machine dies for whatever reason and heaven forbid that happens, but you know, life happens and your local system croaks, and you have to go get a new one at least for this class. All your all your work isn't lost. It's all still safe and running in the cloud. And should you run out of credit, just let me know and I can give you more. Any other questions? Any other things that uh, you need me to demo? If not, that I will end the recording that way we don't have dead space or dead air and of course we'll still we'll stick around to 